Hi right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the Fairly Lame Podcast. My name is Dom, and as always, this is your home of positive, feel-good news about the environment. We're up to episode 24 already, so absolutely flying through this. But for those of you who may be new around here, just, uh, you know, what you can expect. So each and every Monday, Australian time, I think the exact time, or I know the exact time, is 3 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Time at the moment. So that's when this drops on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, all that good stuff, right? And yeah, we just go over positive, feel-good news about the environment from all around the world. So if you're listening to this and you come across a really interesting news story about your country, make sure to either drop it in the description or the comments if you're listening or watching on YouTube, as well as DM me on Instagram if you're just listening to audio only, uh, as well as leave your flags down in the comments down below. I've started to do this on a few videos now. And it's, I don't know, just a really interesting way of learning where everyone's from. And yeah, just a great way to find some news that people can connect to a bit more. As previously, it was pretty heavy in Australia, but now, you know, we're going global. Hopefully one day we can uh, take this show to America. We'll take it on the road, do a couple out of a van or something. But we'll see how we go. We'll get straight into it, guys. So the first topic we're going over today is how the endangered scarlet macaw is being protected by its former hunters in Honduras. How fireflies use heart-shaped bioluminescence to attract a partner. For the first time in almost 50 years, no rhinos were poached in Indian national parks. Then how paying fishermen to not catch sharks and rays could actually be a viable tool for conservation. We'll also have a look at the success of natural mangrove regeneration in Indonesia. And finally, how algae could be a part of the solution for fashion's massive environmental impact. So to get straight into it, as always, all these links for these articles are down in the description below, as well as the timestamps if you want to skip to a particular story of interest. Uh, And also over on YouTube, we have a screen recording set up, uh, you know, if you want to have a look at some nice, pretty pictures like these ones that the incredible folks over at uh, National Geographic have included. This bird's protectors are their former hunters, saying it was my turn to help them. So Pantin Lopez has dedicated the last 12 years to protecting the scarlet macaw. Pantin and her husband live in Los Moquita in the northeast corner of Honduras, which has the largest wilderness area in Central America and is the only place in the country where scarlet macaws fly freely. Pantin and her husband, Santiago, live in a small village called Mabita, where most of its inhabitants protect these exotic birds and the rest of the wildlife surrounding them. So twice a day, she prepares food for 40 to 60 macaws that come to her village for feedings. Pantin also cares for several other birds at a rescue center where birds retrieved by poachers or chicks removed from their nests are taken for care until they can fly freely. Years ago, her husband supported the family by planting beans, plantain, and yucca, and by selling macaw eggs and fledglings as pets, not realizing it would have a detrimental impact on the bird population. When he learned that the number of macaws was drastically declining, he decided to become a guardian of their nests. For many years, the macaws helped me by selling them to be able to buy food for my family. Now it was my turn to help them. Before 1990, the hunting and sale of wild species was legal and thousands of macaws disappeared, placing some of the animals at risk of extinction. The couple's work drew the attention of international organisations such as One Earth Conservation based in New York, which provides funds for a program to monitor and strengthen the macaw population with the support of Indigenous residents. Former poachers were paid about $10 per day to help care for the macaws and Panting was tipped to serve as a community's project director. Mabita's inhabitants didn't know the harmful impact of extracting baby macaws from their natural environment. In this region, we don't see much money. Before 2010, The only way to get it was by selling macaws, says a former poacher turned conservationist. Seeing that they were disappearing, I decided, together with the community, to protect them. The macaws helped me survive, and now it's my turn to help them. And I just really like this story because I feel like it it shows a human behind poachers. And obviously, like, it's very easy for people like me to sit here and say, don't poach, you know, rhinos and whatnot, Uh, which we have another poaching story in this, uh podcast it's very easy to sit back and say don't poach but then you realize there's a reason behind everything like these guys said they don't get much money the only opportunity they had to make an income was to sell macaws and i mean we're able to find some of the prices and so according to um some wildlife trafficking sources so wildlife trafficking in the area 
generates thousands of dollars in revenue per trafficker every month. A Scarlet Macaw can be illicitly sold on the international market for $1,000. A Great Green Macaw can fetch up to $3,000. It's kind of been known for a while in regards to poaching that a live animal is worth much more than a trophy or a dead animal. But it just... It's so complicated because, you know, people like people need to eat now. People need money now. And in some countries, or in a lot of countries, there's not systems like this set up. And it might not be accessible. Like this, you'd assume this is probably the lucky village. How many other villages are there um, which aren't fortunate enough at the current time to have, a you know, such a scheme in place? And they may potentially still have to rely on selling macaws. Like, for example, this uh, is over on Lion Aid. And they were talking about the value of... Uh, poaching a lion or like trophy hunting or whatever uh, compared to a live lion. So they say that trophy hunters would charge between $40,000 to $120,000 for a 21-day uh, safari to shoot one of the um, the kings of the jungle. Uh, but then some time ago, an economist placed the value on a live male, just one live male, uh, at around $500,000 per year in terms of tourism income to the national park. And then if you want to go into how they came up with 500,000, they've got a couple of extra numbers in this paragraph talking about how Kenya earns $1 billion from tourism. And then, you know, they've got 1,400 lines. So the actual figure might be about 357,000. As always, all the links are down below if you want to read up on it. Um, but yeah, now just thinking about it, I think we will change the order of these stories just to uh, fit a bit nicely but yeah don't have too much to add to that one we have changed up the order of the stories because i think the next one ties in very nicely but it's just a great little thought exercise again it's only one thing being able to go through the motions sitting so far away but just imagining if you were in that situation and yeah you have to provide for a family i think they said they had like six kids and i got another question before we get into this next story which actually ties in really well um i, I couldn't find any information about why they need to feed the parrots or the macaws rather um i don't know if that's because of deforestation or if they're just feeding the parrots that they're looking after in terms of like the ones that are in rehabilitation for example or if they're feeding wild parrots because i think she said 40 to 60 of them come to a village for food and shout out to emma gracie on instagram she left her uh the indonesian flag below so we've got a couple stories from Indonesia in today's video. But yeah, if you want your country included, please drop it either in the comments or over on Instagram or TikTok. Um, and so we'll get into the story and I'm sure some of the questions will naturally present themselves. Paying fishes to ease off sharks and rays is cost-effective conservation. So to set the scene a little bit, so more than a third of all elasmobranch shark and uh, ray species are at risk of extinction due to overfishing. Indonesia is a hotspot of both uh, elasmobranch biodiversity and one of the leading shark and ray exporters in the world, putting already critically endangered species such as hammerhead sharks and wedge fish under great pressure. Reducing that fishing pressure could be accomplished cost-effectively according to a new study coming out of the University of Oxford, which found an investment of $71,000 to $235,000 could protect up to 18,500 hammerheads and 2,140 wedge fish per year at two sites in Indonesia. So these funds would go towards paying fishers to not catch these animals, a form of payments for ecosystem services. In concept, this is a win-win. More sharks and rays survive, keeping marine food webs intact and elasmobranch populations healthy. And fishers earn an income by protecting animals instead of exploiting them. So there was a bit of, you know, back and forth between the fishermen and the conservationists, which seems like it just has to happen these days, you know, for a more effective approach. And the fishers agreed that under a business as usual scenario, they would catch the same amount or more of hammerheads and wedge fish in the future. Fines, they said, also wouldn't sway them from catching these animals or keeping them when caught as bycatch. But nearly all the interviewees, 96 to 98% of them, reported they would stop landing hammerheads and wedge fish if they were paid for the income they missed out on by doing so. Fishers in ACE. A-C-E-H, apologies if I'm saying that wrong, I'm 100% M, said they would accept about $1.80 
per uh, hammerhead and $7.64 per wedge fish, whereas fishes in Lombok asked for 210 and 588 respectively. And you know, my first question when reading that was, how can there be such a big difference between numbers? But apparently, the researchers cross-checked these values in local fish markets and they were in fact reasonable. And if you crunch the numbers overall, on an annual basis, the number of sharks you could potentially save per dollar turned out to be very cost effective. And then this article kind of addresses the question from the first one about where the money comes from. So of course the money to pay fishers to protect these animals must come from somewhere. Dive tourism is one possibility and back in 2022 another study was published showing tourists in the two towns we previously mentioned that I'm just going to butcher again, AC, I don't know, and East Lombok or Bok, uh, would be willing to pay a tourism levy of around $15 to $20 per person, totaling millions of dollars each year, plenty to pay fishers in these two locations to protect hammerheads and wedgefish. And I'm assuming the reason why tourists would be, you know, so okay with paying $15, $20 more would potentially be the, you know, the pitch of the greater diversity, right? If they're going on dives, you want to see as many animals as possible. You don't want to go down there and just see a couple sea urchins and whatnot rolling about uh, and some seaweed. Like. You want to see sharks and dolphins. I don't know if there's... Surely there's dolphins in Indonesia. A couple turtles, whatnot. Um, and yeah, and so the less fishing, you know, the less people catching sharks and rays, more in the water, more for you to see, a more exciting experience. And I wonder if this could be expanded to other species and as the diversity increases in the area if you could just continue charging a levy uh, in terms of, you know, bumping up prices here and there, and then, you know, different kickbacks to different fishermen targeting different species to make a more biodiverse uh, and more, you know, more thrilling experience if you're seeing bloody hammerhead sharks swimming about. All right, guys, before we get into this next story, could you please head over to Instagram and TikTok at fellylame underscore to give us a follow over there. I'm trying to keep the news stories separate. So the news stories you see over on you know social media whatever in the short form content they're going to be completely different to what we're covering on the podcast and vice versa just you know a bit more incentive to actually follow on different platforms and even between platforms even the videos on tiktok are going to start having a different look to that of instagram so make sure you check them all out just to you know Keep it all interesting rather than going over the same stories, which was a bit of a waste of time. So, you know, always trying to improve. Uh, and I wasn't planning to say this, but if you have any other ways I can improve the podcast, please let me know down below. But back to the good news. And next, we'll have a look at how these fireflies are flirting with heart-shaped lanterns. Apparently, every species of flashing firefly uses a secret code to attract their mates, and these ones do it with a light-up heart. So fireflies have not only figured out the art of lighting up their bodies, but they do so by creating the most efficient light on Earth. They use that energy-efficient bioluminescence to attract mates, and some species even synchronize their flashes. So adding even more charm for Firefly fans, fl- oh, that's hard to say, Firefly fan, fi- Firefly fans, female fireflies from, that's the sentence from hell. You don't want a podcast about fireflies. So <laughs> let's try that one again. So adding even more charm for Firefly fans, female fireflies from the species Photinus pyralis make their bids for love with a heart-shaped light. Every firefly species has a special pattern to communicate with potential partners. Like Mother Nature's very own flashing emoji, when P. Pyralis spies the special signal from a fellow species fella. How many Fs are in this article? Jeez, this is gonna this is gonna be tricky. She twists her abdomen in his direction and reveals her secret heart. The male of the species, known as a common eastern firefly or big dipper, gets her attention by tracing out an acrobatic J in the sky, doing so in a big graceful dipping motion, hence the name Big Dipper. Never seen a firefly in the wild, never been to America. Um, I wonder what that's like. I've ne- I don't think I've ever seen a firefly, and I've never seen glowworms. Oh, I've definitely never seen glowworms, but I've never even seen the bioluminescence. You know those waves? I think we had a video on it a couple weeks ago. Um, in Auckland, there was a recent event where, you know, there's blue waves and whatnot. Never been able to see that. And I think the other week there was, or a couple months ago, there was red waves 
due to an algal bloom, potentially. Um, but yeah, when a love connection is made between the two fireflies, our Big Dipper comes bearing a nuptial gift, a present of more than 200 assorted nutrients, kind of like a box of chocolates. You know, topical, coming up to... Uh, what do you call it? Uh, Valentine's Day. And some of uh, the chemicals in these boxes of chocolates are lucibophagins. Lucibophagins? If you say it, if you say it quickly, surely it sounds right. Uh, defensive chemicals fireflies secrete to ward off predators like spiders and birds. These defensive chemicals may help protect her. That's kind of wholesome. That's nice. Firefly, oh, oh, Big Dipper's got some, uh, you know, loves romance. He just loves love. And it also eventually leads to baby fireflies complete with Big Dips and heart-shaped lanterns so that a new generation of fireflies can light up the nighttime sky with their special language of love. So it's just a nice little article. I don't know. I've always wanted to see a firefly and uh, even... Even those glowworms we were talking about earlier, any story about them, they just seem so bloody magical. Easy way to get featured on the Fairly Lame podcast. Have a story about bloody lighting up insects. But then uh, if you want to see what it looks like, there is a little gif on uh, the website on Tree Hugger where you can see the little heart illuminating. It's the animal version of how it feels when you see the one. There you go. That's one to end on. Next, we have a story uh, coming over from India, where for the first time since 1977, zero rhinos were poached in India's national parks. So in May 2021, a new chief minister of the Indian state of Assam set out to thoroughly put an end to poaching in the state's protected areas. Now, 20 months later, the forestry and police departments of the state have reported that 2022 saw no rhinos lost to poaching for the first time since 1977. Located on the border of Tibet and China to the north and Myanmar to the east, Assam is one of the richest biodiversity zones in the world and it contains four national parks and a wildlife sanctuary. And together, these four protected areas make up most of the one-horned rhinoceros' range in the country and of the 2,895 rhinos in the state, nearly all of that number can be found inside the parks. So Chief Minister Sama put together a special anti-poaching task force led by Special Director General of Police. The task force created a database of past incidents of rhino poaching with details on when, how and where they took place. Convicted poachers had their phones monitored and local fishermen and villagers were brought on as informants. The rhinos were treated like presents. Sophisticated police commando teams patrolled the parks with night vision equipment and drones and the number of teams increased on full moon nights. When flooding in Kazaranga drove the rhinos to higher ground during the 2022 monsoon season, the team stayed in the field 24-7 until the animals could disperse again after the waters receded. If we continue this pressure, rhino poaching will stop completely. For this, the cost of poachers has to be higher than the profit they earn. A colleague notes that coordination has become so thorough that poacher arrest rates are now being measured weekly rather than monthly as before. It's a kind of devotion that's seen the numbers of one horn rhinos climb from just around 100 in 1910 to almost 3,000 today. And I don't know, I'm pretty, I guess, ignorant to the biodiversity that exists over in India. Like, I definitely didn't know there were rhinos there. And I think, like, I was half surprised to find that cheetahs were re- uh, introduced there. I, in my head, like now it kind of makes sense. And I feel like I've heard that before, but when I saw that story, I was a bit like, Oh, what the hell? Um, but yeah, I mean, I could barely tell you any other species, uh, any other iconic, you know, well-known Indian, if it's, oh, maybe cobras. I don't know. But for our next story is over in Indonesia again. So again, shout out to the great, uh, Gracie, Emma Gracie, Emma Gracie, surely. Yeah, Emma Gracie over on Instagram. Again, if you want to be featured, comment on Instagram. But so this is looking at how mangrove restoration gives hope to Indonesia's sinking shores. And mangroves, wetlands, salt marshes, seagrass meadows, God's gift to carbon storage. They store it underwater. So in theory, it can be stored for millennia because it doesn't burn down uh, and there's slower decomposition. You know, when things decompose, they release... Uh, fossil, not fossil, <laughs> not fossil fuels. They release um, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So slower decomposition is a good thing. Um, and yeah, incredible for biodiversity and fishing, uh, the fishing industry as well. 
And we've got some storytellers uh, over here, so I'm a big fan of this already. So in a village on the Indonesian island of Java, eight men are wielding saws and machetes with practice precision, preparing long bamboo poles that they will use to defend their embattled community. The men are fighting back against erosion and rising sea levels that have swallowed up vast areas of land along Java's north coast. Key to their strategy is restoring a protective belt of mangroves. So to do this, they create the old sediment traps, right? So we trap sediment using local bamboo and nets. And the hope is that when we have enough sediment accumulating, seeds that drop off the mangrove can settle and grow. And so past attempts to reinforce the coast have involved concrete seawalls and mangrove replanting schemes. But heavy seawalls sank into the soft mud and the water was too deep and turbulent for the mangrove saplings. Villagers and contractors have erected some 3.4 kilometers of wave calming structures in the shallows along a 20 kilometer stretch of coast. Instead of washing away precious soil, the tides deposit part of the sediment load, creating good conditions for mangroves to regrow. When a mangrove forest is rehabilitated and is in good condition, the balance in the ecosystem provides a range of benefits to the community. A good mangrove forest will act as a habitat for marine life, including fish and shrimp. Farmers have also agreed to let mangroves grow on part of their land after learning about how the trees not only protect against erosion, but also improve conditions in their ponds. Nearly 300 farmers have been schooled in sustainable techniques such as the production and use of organic fertilizer that have boosted their returns, sometimes spectacularly. Their new environmentally friendly approach eliminated the use of artificial fertilizer and improved the survival rates of both farmed fish and shrimp. Another bonus of natural regeneration is the richness of the mangrove forest. While replanting schemes tend to use seedlings only of a few species, a dozen mangrove species have taken root around Damak. Uh, again, apologies if I said that wrong. A diversity that makes the forest more resilient to climate change and other stresses. And the value of mangrove ecosystems is absolutely insane. I'm sure I go on about it uh, probably too much, but you know, Protect coastlines, which is going to be extremely important moving forward. They do smell, which is a negative, but I don't reckon they smell that badly, depending on the area. Uh, but then, obviously, nurseries for a whole heap of fish species. They also filter water, keep waterways and the oceans healthier, and also store a ton of carbon. And then our final story for today is looking at the possibility of algae becoming the future of global fashion. Nutritious and fast growing, algae already has a following as an alternative protein among health fanatics. A new generation of sustainable fashion startups wants us to wear it as well. And if you may not be up to date with what's going on in the world of algae, so there is research as well looking at how feeding cows just a little bit of seaweed each day, I think it's about 100 grams or so, it's not much. Uh, we Again, we went over uh, in one of the earlier podcasts. Um, feeding, uh, this is on the... Guardian? On the Guardian? Yeah. So, researchers who put a small amount of seaweed into the feed of cattle over the course of five months found that the new diet caused the bovines to belch out 82% less methane, which is, you know, a greenhouse gas. And I think the warming is more intense over a short period of time than uh, carbon dioxide. But then there's also the benefit of algae in terms of food. So the global population will reach nearly 10 billion within the next three decades. Each degree of warming reduces crops by up to a quarter. Prolonged droughts or floods exacerbate the problem. To counter that, agricultural productivity must double in the next 30 years to meet demand. Uh, and Dr. Charles Green of Washington University in Seattle said, agriculture provides the backbone of today's global food production system. However, its potential to meet the world's nutritional demands by 2050 is limited. Marine microalgae, not macroalgae. Macroalgae is talking about things like seaweed, which is what... Uh, the story we're looking at is uh, getting at, but marine microalgae will help fill the projected nutritional gap while simultaneously improving overall environmental sustainability and ocean health. And so back to the news story. And so fashion, we all know how harmful fast fashion is. For those who don't know, that's actually how Fairly Lame started. We started looking at sustainable clothing brands, but uh, fast fashion produces more than 100 billion garments annually, about 14 per person, and is responsible for 10% 
of humanity's emissions, which is actually more than international airfares, or air travel rather. And so Charlotte McCurdy, a researcher, designer, and assistant professor at Arizona State University, wants to tackle the problem of fashion waste, thinking not just about where the cast-offs or cut-offs, I guess you'd say, end up, but also how the clothes are made. Synthetic textiles like polyester, the cheapest and most disposable of all, are made from fossil fuels. And the dyes used to get that inky black are derived from crude oil. So back in 2018, McCurdy set about designing a raincoat made from marine macroalgae, aka seaweed, which absorbs carbon instead. The choice of garment was a deliberate comment on what we need to wear to protect ourselves against a climate that's going haywire because of human activity. So they did tons of experiments and pulled together tons of technologies. They had hundreds of beautiful failures before they were able to create this clear, very consistent plastic that is entirely free from synthetics and chemicals and is made only of algae. So algae is already used in biofuels and bioplastics. It's attracting particular attention because it's fast and cheap to grow, doesn't need much water and sucks carbon dioxide from the air. Photosynthesizing aquatic organisms produce about 70% of the oxygen in our atmosphere, more than all forest combines. That means algae is not just less bad for the climate, but potentially positive. And Renata Kebs developed an algae-based alternative to the chemical and petroleum-based dyes ubiquitous in the clothing industry. And they said our partners don't have to change the machinery, but in the end, they're not harming the environment. They use less water, less energy, less transportation, and even less lead time. It takes about 180 days to grow cotton. Algae only takes three weeks. And Renata Krebs has a company called Algeing, and so Algeing's algae is grown vertically in a closed loop solar powered system in southern Israel on land that can't be used for conventional agriculture. It requires 80% less water than cotton and no pesticides to grow, and it avoids the chemicals used to process wool or make commercial dyes. And so I've got a couple questions for you guys. The first one is what are your thoughts on algae supplements? Let me know if you take them. I've heard a, really, a lot of really good things about them. I've never tried them myself, but definitely not against it. Uh, and it does sound very interesting. I heard, especially in terms of energy, it can be quite um, quite good. And it can it's a bit of a, not an all-rounder, but it can tick a few boxes. And so, yeah, apparently algae produces amino acids, fatty acids, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, polymers, and carbohydrates. So, yeah, let me know if you've taken a algae supplement or you would and then my second question is about the first story we went over about the uh, ex-poachers now getting paid ten dollars a day to look after the macaws in um honduras i believe it was uh where do you guys think that money's coming from because i think i've joined the dots i'm assuming that it's coming from that one earth foundation but i guess the question i was kind of asking is where would they get the money from? Like, are they just cycling the money out of another project? What do you guys reckon? And do you think this could potentially have a negative impact on attracting more macaws to the village uh, than that actually need them? Yeah, let me know down below. That's been this week's episode of the Fair Lane Podcast. Make sure to head over to TikTok and Instagram where we go over different news videos. At the start, there was a fair bit of overlap between the podcast and Instagram. Now we're trying to keep it all separate. So stories you see on Instagram will just stay on there for the most part, depending on the news, because, you know, there's only so much going on in a week and we're trying to keep it quite uh, relevant and quite um, recent as well. But yeah, we'll see you guys next time. Cheers.